I want to sort of uh, break the ice with a little quiz. Uh, and I encourage everyone to participate. Just shout out. Don't feel um, uh, nervous or apprehensive about like getting it right or getting it wrong. The, the sort of point is that oftentimes, just because of the, the structure of how we've approached perfects for, for decades, um, this isn't a, really a question that we ask. Um, so I want us to start by just thinking about that question. Uh, does this verb perfect? Uh, some of the, and I've, I've thrown a, a bunch of easy ones in too. So uh, apoluomi, uh, destroy in the active, perish in the middle, middle passive. What do you think? Does it form a perfect? Yes, no? Yes, it does. Yeah. So um, these are all he lexical head words. I'm not going to give like the, the perfect inflection because that's what you're guessing. Uh, uh, Amy, perfect, right? What do you think, guys? No, excellent. Yeah, you know that. Um, Erkomai. Oh yeah. True. Pero. Um, Yes. Arkeo, be sufficient, satisfy enough. What do you think? N I see some shaking heads, no. And that's right, not a perfect. Um, Gelao, laugh. Any idea? Also, f also a no. Pistevo. Is it true? Sorry, I went ahead on my computer before I went ahead on the uh, cru cruo. Anything? Any guess? Also false. Um, Aga poeo is also a false. But regular poeo is a yes. Oh yeah. Isn't that interesting? Sozo. Yes. This is a false. Um, and this next one, um, I've already given a hint from, um, from the previous one, we'll look at kakopotheo. These compound ones, uh, also false. Eucharisto. Yes. Astrapto. Any guesses? Correct. Well done. Yes or no, true or false here? Yeah. Um, so that's our little quiz. Um, so. These yeses and noes, some of these verbs do form perfect, some of them don't. Um, and I'm not necessarily claiming that the, the, the perfect with these various lexemes is some sort of definite or absolute impossibility. Um, just that when uh, speakers were using the Greek language, they didn't find the perfect and the semantics of the perfect useful uh, for for the sorts of events that these verbs denote. And in turn, that this lack of use is semantically motivated. Um, so I mean, a lot of these verbs, there, there might have been a place where some, some very creative language speaker wanted to um, take galao or um, or one of the other verbs that we don't find perfects in Greek texts. Um, and this was mostly from Perseus data, although I checked a few against the TLG as well. Um, they could have they could have tried to like um, put it in there um, and just sort of squeeze the perfect into that verb. And there are some places, especially like, like in Aristophanes and the, the the comedies, where you find some of these verbs where the perfect doesn't appear anywhere else, but it does appear there. Um, because that's where people are playing with language. Um, 
So just to sort of quickly run through, these are some of the, uh, oh, these look better on my screen. I, so, oh well. These are some of the classes of um, verbs that don't form perfects um, in our data. So some state predicates, um, these are all quant quantity, quality, and temporal modal states. Um, cognition and emotion states, lots of them here too. Um, experiential physiological states, um, location and position, um, also some activity predicates. So these are dynamic verbs, um, but they don't like have a, they don't signal a, a, con, a change of state in a subject or in an object. Um, uh, speech and sound activity predicates. Um, so all of these verbs, though, so they don't form perfects. Um, with the state, with the state verbs, um, same thing with um, the the semifactives. I went fast through the slides. Semifactives are things like clap, where it just sort of there's a thing that happens. Um, it doesn't really take any, up any time, and there wasn't really a change. Like if lightning flashes across the sky, the sky's the same afterward. Um, we perceive these events as not changing anything in the world. And so we, we have verbs that talk about these kinds of events. And the perfect doesn't really hang out with those sorts of events either. Um, and then finally, these activity predicates don't get along very, very well either. So then what, what is a perfect in terms of like the, the lexicon? Um, and when we look at the, the literature, Lots of people say different things, so let's sort of look at some verbs first. Caused motion, caused process, lots of perfects here. Um, caused states, transference verbs, also lots of perfects. Um, caused, caused states with status and location, cognition and judgment, uh, physiological and grooming verbs. Um, transformations, so mix, defile, whitewash, um, begin and end. Oh, my formatting. Um, processes that involve motion that where there is a change, so follow, come, go, rise, uh, depart. Communication verbs especially. Um, Processes like marry and becoming, um, defeat. Um, some states, right? I mean, we all can think of states like uh, agapao, pistevo, we saw. Um, uh, mind and body, um, and just sort of here's some various ones. Uh, so change of state predicates dominate uh, the field in terms of what what is possible, but there's still some state predicates, and that's kind of funny, isn't it? Like a lot of state predicates don't form perfects, um, but there are a few that do. So what kind of motivates that? That's the question we'll be looking at, um, and then just the fact that these sort of weird distribution patterns across the verbal lexicon they don't really get a lot of attention. Um, when you look at uh, the secondary literature, when you pick up um, Fanning or, or, or Campbell's book or um, Porter's book. Um, so that's something that's sort of uh, surprising to me. Uh, on the other hand, these are some of the things that the literature does say. Uh, Dr. Porter observes that um, there's a surprising consistency in grammars about how the perfect is uh, discussed. Uh, I'm not entirely sure whether it's sort of like a compliment or a sort of criticism. Uh, it could go either way in some sense. Um, and I've, I've taken some quotes for like definitions of the perfect and I've kind of grouped them together. So there's some people who say, talk about the perfect relative to English. 
uh, like Zerwick and Swetnam and Dag Haug, although Dag Haug is a little more complicated, um, but that's a, that's a whole other story. Event completion is, is a very, very common theme, um, but there are a few ways to talk about it. So some people talk about a, the present effect and they sort of use that temporal language. Other people just, just talk about event completion and not really anything else. Um, and here's lots of references to that. Our event, event completion and result state. So now that's not really temporal language, that's more aspectual-like language. Uh, and then sort of the just stative people. Um, there are a number of those as well. Um, and um, most of those you can see are, are more recent. So McKay, 94, Porter, 89, and this is from the his um, 1999 intermediate grammar. Um, or the sort of the something else people, and this is sort of a uh, diverse bunch. Um, Wallace has, has a definition that's sort of a blend of all sorts of things, um, and, and Fanning, um, as, as Campbell talked about already, he, he takes this piece from the Atkins Art of State, and then he talks about him perfective aspect, and he, and he mixes, like, takes all these chunks together, and that's sort of the meaning of the perfect grammaticalized and Evans and Campbell sort of do a similar thing in terms of the um, different pieces, so remoteness and um, uh, proximity and that heightenedness and imperfectivity. Um, another one that I didn't put in was uh, uh, Nick Ellis and Mark Dubis and I's our um, Jets piece from a couple years ago, um, but that we're sort of in this sort of something else category as well. Um, but the, the big point is that this is a lot of diversity, like in this literature. There's lots of different uh, definitions, and the way we talk about them, we talk about them as if they're competing with each other. Um, and, and maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, maybe, maybe compete is a word that suggests that there's a winner and there's a loser, and uh, I happen to be, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with, with, with Con Campbell, I'm good friends um, with, with Fanning, and, um, and, I, I'm, and I know a lot of the, the contemporary scholars, we, they're really smart people. Uh, all, of, all of the dead grammarians, like in, that, in the, my list of grammars, they, were, they seemed pretty smart too. They were probably all smarter than me, that's for sure. Um, and, and, and while I very much agree with Dr. Porter in his, his paper yesterday that uh, the, the frameworks that we use affect our discussions, there's also a sense in which that we need to sort of acknowledge when we're reading the old grammarians that they knew, they knew Greek really well. And even if they don't have the language to describe what they're seeing, uh, they're seeing a pattern, and so their, their descriptions, however they're flawed or what ways they're flawed, are motivated by substantive issues of data, like in the language itself, and the language's structure. There's some relationship between what Greek grammar is and how they described it. Um, so maybe not use the word compete there. Um, so not all definitions are correct either. Um, like the English ones are, can get really bad. Um, and, and that's something we've sort of talked about as a theme through, the, um, through the yesterday and today as well. Uh, so what does the data say? Um, and I'm a data guy. I love talking about um, specific examples, so there's going to be a lot of, a lot of those. Um, and we're going to sort of organize the whole thing around transitivity. Um, and you might look at the slides and think, well, high transitivity sounds like a strange thing to say, because transitivity is just like, does it have an object or not? And that's true. Um, but there's also a sense in which uh, transitivity is a scalar thing. 
So, for example, if I say that I kicked a ball, um, that's more transitive than I read a book, right? There's the, like the agency involved is is greater. The um, the energy exerted from from the subject, the agent, into the object, the ball. There's an energy transfer. Um, whereas with um, I read a book, the the book doesn't isn't the book doesn't come out any different at the end. Like it's not a different book. What's changed is now the subject. The subject has undergone a change of state because um, now I have that knowledge from the book that I didn't before. So even amongst clauses that have an object and are syntactically transitive, we can sort of rank them into ones that are more transitive and ones that are less transitive. Um, and the interesting, an interesting thing happens with the data around the perfect once we do that. Um, so here's a sort of basic structure of what a of what the, the sort of dynamic event, both whether transitive or intransitive, looks like. A process begins and is instigated by an agent. Um, it has some sort of internal structure, um, and then it's completed. Uh, pretty simple. And we'll come, back, we'll come back to this as we continue through. Um, so what I'd want to call the very highest transit events, those breaking um, caused actions, we have an agentative subject, an overtly highly distinguishable object from the, um, from the subject, and the object undergoes a change of state, not the subject, um, and the agent isn't affected. Um, and when we get to these, these, there's a small class of verbs that are really high on this scale, um, like break verbs, and the funny thing is that when you look at them, they tend not to have perfect active forms. So it's a good thing that we talked about voice first. I really appreciated that, that Pennington and Jonathan covered all of that already. Um, the perfect is, is middle only for a lot of these really high transitive forms. Um, and some of them are, are active only, but the, but the active is still intransitive. Uh, so here we have this, this break verb, um, and the perfective and imperfective um, have an object, and that object is distinguishable highly from the subject, and uh, the agent affects a change on it, and it is now broken. And the perfect sort of reflects um, not necessarily the, the state that resulted from the action of breaking, so much as like, uh, I, I want to... I want, maybe it's better to think about it in terms of um, an alternation in the paradigm, right? So the event is referred to by the perfective or imperfective forms, and then the result is referred to by the perfect. Um, so there might not be a, um, a previous event in the discourse that where that, the breaking happened. All that matters is that the breaking exists now, so, and it's that alternation. Um, when we go down a little bit in transitivity, this is mostly, these are mostly caused motion verbs, um, yeah, and transference, uh, some finish and achieve verbs, and a lot of labor production. Uh, they still have an agentative subject, um, but now all of a sudden the, um, the subject is also affected by the event in some way. Um, and these are the ones that now you have a transitive perfect um, that can then also be passivized the same way you could do with other things. Um, so, for example, um, Iro, take away, remove, he is lifted um, in active, and then the middle is removed, and then um, okay, go, uh, I have ported out uh, active. The love of God has been poured out middle for both these perfects. Um, so, and I won't go through voice with all of them, just wanted to give this sort of picture. Uh, Dirumi has given um, the glory which you have given to me, I have given to them. Uh, so you have this sort of, the, this, the event ends and now there's this result state. Um, 
I did away with childish things. Uh, and so finish and achieve verbs, very common with uh, having a transitive active as well. So uh, middling, middling transitivity verbs, they're sort of sitting in the middle of this transitive continuum. Um, the agent is still a, um, a subject and still causes an event, um, but like the agent's in involvement in the, in the event has increased. Um, so these are mostly communication verbs. And, and when we speak, when I'm communicating to you, I'm participating cognitively in, in whatever you're processing in your head. So it's um, the, the energy transfer is, is cognitive rather than physical. So it's also less transitive in that sense as well. Um, and this is a really fun class. This is my favorite class of verbs for perfects because um, there's some really interesting uses. Uh, the main thing about these verbs is this, the assumption that um, the communication uh, has been achieved or affected. And, and that's what we see regularly with how the perfect is used with, with these sorts of verbs. Um, so there's no necessary sense of like, God as, as a caller, like in the state of calling. It's that the calling happened um, and you are called. So, Claudius commanded the Jews to leave Rome, and they did. Like, they had to obey his command. Um, Grafo, that you probably recognize, this is a very common perfect one, especially in the middle. Uh, it is written, or maybe it stands written. Um, but in the active, uh, it often refers to the, the ending, the, the completion of of writing. So here, Pilate uh, is encountering the, the Jewish priests. They're really annoyed that he wrote that Jesus is the king of the Jews, and that's why he's being executed, and they want him to change it and say, well, instead, this man says he was king of the Jews. That's, what, that's his crime. Um, and Pilate says to him, no, uh, I'm not. It's, it's written, uh, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to go back and have it redone. What I've written, I've written. That's it. But other times, and this is going back a little back in time to the classical period, there are also instances where, where grapho in the active does refer to the state of the subject. So um, this, this example is from the fragments of Papias. Um, as you, Eusebius, the historian of church history, is talking about the authorship of the Gospels, and, and he says, well, and then we have these statements from, from Mark, um, who is the author of the gospel? And then he goes on and talks about how Peter um, told Mark all of what happened to, to him and Jesus, and Mark wrote it down. And, and the focus is now not on that Mark finished writing a, a text, but that Mark is the one who wrote it. Um, another function of, of, of communica communication verbs uh, is uh, this sort of, there's an effect often where the saying, I have said it, um, affects that um, the, whatever is said is then true and real and acted upon. So um, this, this example from the Septuagint, um, Solomon wants to kill Joab because He's a traitor for some reason in Solomon's mind. Um, so he sends, sends someone out to, to, the, to the tent of the Lord where Job is hidden. Um, and Job refused to come out because if I come out, I'll die. Um, and the man comes back to Solomon and Solomon said, and reports to him, thus Job spoke, Leilaliken. Um, and thus he responded. <laughs> and the king says, okay, well, if he said it, like, let it be done. Like it, if he said, it, like it's as good as it's as his. If he says he's dead, then it's as good as him being dead. Uh, and uh, this happens in prophecy a lot. 
and it's lots of fun. So you see at the very top, verse 4, and then the Lord talks a lot um, through Ezekiel. And then at the end of the prophecy where um, all of the punishments and all of the condemnation against Israel and Judah are sort of coming to a conclusion, I, the Lord, have spoken. Um, thus it is declared, thus it, thus it will be. Um, and, and again, there isn't necessarily a sense of like current relevance that I've spoken. It's just the declaration that everything that I've said is now, I'm at the end of my, my declaration that you need to communicate to the people. And, and this is the weight that I put upon it as the authority of the one who speaks. Uh, this is also very common in uh, Kings. Nebuchadnezzar writes a letter in the uh, Old Testament Apocrypha, Judith. Uh, and at the end of the letter, he, he ends his letter with this same um, lelalika. Um, Thus I have spoken. And that's the end of the letter. And it's the declaration. It goes out through the kingdom. It is posted. Um, and these, everyone needs to act on the basis of these words because it is spoken uh, by the king. So, and finally, the low transitivity perfects. Um, these also have a perfect, transitive perfect active. Um, here, um, rather than the object undergoing a change of state, it's now the subject. Um, the subject still tends to be volitional, an agent in the, in the event, but it's the object that affects the change. So this is like reading the book where I'm participating and I'm choosing to read a book, but the, I'm getting information and cognitively changing as I read. So things that fall into this domain are the learning verbs, reciprocity, benefactive transference, like receiving, um, non-caused motion, et cetera. So here's a, here's a, oh dear. Here's an example of a reciprocity verb. Um, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, Philippians, uh, in the perfective, the aorist, and then First Peter in the uh, imperfective, in the present, but to the extent that you are sharing in Christ's suffering, um, but then with the perfect, it becomes intransitive rather than the transitive uh, again. So we've, we've switched back to that pattern of uh, transitive non-perfects and intransitive perfects. So the children are partakers of blood and flesh. Um, similarly with, with learn, Montano, and escape, um, note here that there's sort of this convergence of the completion of the event is itself the same as the state that that uh, arises, the result. Um, their tongue has learned how to speak lies is the same as their tongue knows how to speak lies. It has escaped. It is hidden from all people. Uh, similarly, with, um, with fight, which this is a reciprocal verb, like I get into uh, fisticuffs. Um, this was a really obscure one, but I was trying, really trying to find a perfect for this verb that was, um, that was relatively clear. Uh, this, this is from the pseudepigrapha, but it's, it's David and this angel that they've imagined where David is want, wanting to build the temple and, and the angel is reporting that the Lord says no. Um, and it's because, not that he has fought or has participated in fighting, but that he was a warrior. Um, and that's, that's that status that resulted from his life of, of battle. Um, so that's all the transitive verbs, but we still have these dynamic intransitive verbs. They're still not states. We're, we're, we'll get to them. Um, so these have a single participant that undergoes a process, um, translational motion, body action. You might, you might recognize that um, if you, some of these are things that uh, we've, are categories from voice. Uh, and you might have heard Jonathan Pennington talk, mention 
the body action grooming stuff um, just before, uh, spontaneous events and generic happen verbs, these are all dynamic and transitive events. So, tayo, trip or fall. This is an interesting verb because you can trip, but there wasn't a change of state. I'm, I didn't fall over. I'm not going to fall over. I'm not going to do it again and fall. Um, so, so sometimes, depending on how the, the context of the passage, on what's happening, you could use it as a semifactive, where there is no actual change, or it can be telic. There's a change of state. Um, um, telic from telos. Um, and both of those are possible. So for example, in the aorist, um, Paul, Paul asked in Romans, did they stumble such that they fell? No, certainly not. Uh, and that's the sort of, that's that semifactive reading, where, um, whereas in the Septuagint in First Kingdoms, they fell before Israel and, um, and they are defeated in battle. And they're, they are defeated. There's something happened, energy was, ex was transferred, and, and they are fallen now. Uh, and then, so, in the perfect, then, you can only do the second one and, and refer to the state of the second. Like, the semifactive isn't an option. And it took a lot of searching to find out that that was true. Um, and I did all that, that so that you wouldn't have to. Um, Motion verbs, uh, similarly, um, with the, the translation of motion, translation of motion going from one place to another as opposed to just sitting or standing. And you have, again, this convergence of the end of the, um, the event with the result of the event uh, sort of merging into one thing. Uh, I tell you that Elijah certainly has come, is certainly here. Um, he has died, is dead. This, this verb, engizo, is one of my favorites, draw near. Um, yes, I have favorite perfects. Uh, so in the present and the aorist, um, you have a volitional subject that, that, that moves, and it moves to like a, a reference point. So it comes near the assembly of the righteous men. Or in this case, he never did. But, you know, negation always disrupts things. Um, but in the perfect, uh, it's an inanimate subject, and there isn't motion. It just sort of exists in a proximate state to a reference point. The kingdom of God is near. Um, and there's no assertion of, a, of any change or anything in the perfect. Um, so that's, that's an interesting shift um, for, the, for the nature of the subject to go from a subject that's animate to a subject that's, that's inanimate. Um, so just to summarize, um, the highest transitive verbs only have intransitive perfects. Um, the subject of the perfect exists in a state, and that state exists paradigmatically in the lexicon alongside a transitive non-perfect. Uh, the object of the transitive non-perfect becomes the subject of the intransitive perfect. Um, yeah, and since this is the case, since the perfect is now intransitive, sometimes you get active only ones, and other times you get middle only ones. Uh, and then the middle two groups have transitive perfects, and the active, the object, uh, is then this result state. Uh, current relevance only exists as an implicature. Uh, the perfect is often used as this sort of backgrounding mechanism in narrative. So if you're wanting, like you're telling the story, event, event, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened. Oh, well, but this guy who just did this thing, he had done this earlier, and this thing is relevant to the future, so I should mention it. Um, you use the perfect there, and it's really useful for that. Um, but the, the grammaticalization is primarily the event completion. This thing that has happened, like it's done, um, and I can talk about it because it's completed, uh, and also it's relevant because I'm telling a story and that's how stories work. So 
Similarly, the low transitive verbs have, have transitive and intransitive perfects depending um, a subject undergoes a change of state and exists in that state and we have this merger of completion and result state together. Uh, has come is here. Um, and we have a similar sort of idiosyncrasy in the lexicon with voice. So some verbs, um, some verbs are active only and no middle. Other verbs are middle only and no active, uh, depending. But now, and then finally, the intransitive verbs have intransitive perfects, which makes sense, because they just, they, they refer to the state that resulted from whatever happened. Uh, so now, state predicates. Now these are the weird ones, because you have all this, these state predicates that don't ever form perfects, and then you have this smaller group of state predicates that do form perfects, right? Um, and what we sort of find is that it's only a, it is only a minority of verbs that do form perfects. Um, and so we have this working assumption from the transitive data, you know, all the dynamic verbs where things are happening and energy is being transferred, where event completion and result state, like this seems like it's somehow integral to the meaning of the perfect. So how does that relate to states? Like there's no energy in them, they just sort of exist. Um, so states, they kind of feel as if they're in conflict with, um, with this basic idea. Um, and there's actually a, a metaphorical sort of analogical explanation for what happens with these. Um, one way to do it is to take the state predicate and we sort of squeeze it into the perfect semantics. Um, or we can take the, um, the perfect semantics with this change, the, this completed change, and we can try to squeeze that into a state predicate. Um, and both of these things happen. Um, so, patho, persuade, cause to believe, cause to trust, um, is, is a verb that has a perfect, um, and you have this alternation caused event with then an intransitive perfect. Whereas Pesevo is just believe or trust, but, but both of them, the perfect of patho is sort of analogous to the regular non-perfect um, of Pesevo. Um, so, we'll just sort of go forward. So what, what happens when then Pistevo, when you want to form a perfect with this? Um, well, one way to do it is to like force the, um, the change part of the perfect where you get to the end point, like put it at the beginning of the state. So then um, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Um, a bunch of people have just left. And, and um, well, do you want to go? And, and Peter says, well, where would we go? We have come to believe everything that you said and we, we trust you. Like that's the difference between us and them is like they didn't have that change from unbelief to belief. And now we exist in this state of belief. So here we've just sort of taken something that didn't have a change of state with Pistevo believe and we just sort of squished the change at the beginning. Um, so now we have the result state. Similarly with echo, um, with the perfect in Romans, then in Romans 5.2, we have come to have, we have obtained access by faith. Um, the other option to sort of extend the semantics of the perfect, this is where we end up with this sort of intensive perfect meaning, and this is, has a long tradition uh, in grammars talking about this. Rix Baron in his uh, Syntax and Semantics of Classical Greek, really good little book that everyone should probably have and it's nice and cheap, um, which is nice in academic books. Uh, he, he observes and puts it this way, the case of verbs whose present stem forms um, already to some degree expresses state, the perfect expresses the highest degree of that state. Well, how do we get to that from, from the perfect semantics? Um, and it, it works something like this. 
Um, some types of states, states can be construed as scalars. So like I'm, I can be a little hungry, I can be really hungry, um, I can be just completely famished. Um, and a transitive perfect, on the other hand, like it refers to this completed event and or the resulting state of that event. So this process for the dynamic verbs, the dynamic verbs that form perfects, the perfect sort of exists in this resultative, terminative side of the, of the event structure, okay? And then uh, here's this sort of scale of not hungry to extremely hungry. Um, and you can kind of map one onto the other. Well, where would you put, where would you put the result, uh, like that end point? Uh, you'd put it at, at extremely hungry. Because if, if you were to make, turn this into a change of state, well, you have a state here um, when you're not hungry, and you have a state here that's a little different, and there's a change, and it'll here and here, and all of a sudden, you're, you're really hungry. Um, and English aspectual adverbs do the exact same thing. I'm hungry, I'm completely famished. Completely doesn't, completely means complete, that something is complete. There, but we can use it to talk about hunger, which is a state, it, and hunger isn't complete, ever. It's just very, very hungry. I'm completely hungry, totally exhausted, and we find that uh, with, with perfects and state predicates too. So, um, I was thirsty versus this terrifying example from Philo where from the nature and practice they've become savage and bestial in their total thirst for human blood. Uh, you always need to have a good violent example at least once. <laughs> that's, that's, like, if you read the, any of the linguistic literature, like, that's a very strong tradition um, for any, any topic. Uh, similarly, Pistevo does this as well. Um, so um, Jesus is, is talking and, and saying, this is who I am. And um, Mary replies, uh, yes, Lord, I certainly believe that you are the Son of God. Um, Methuo, again, another favorite example here, um, although I hope not, not here on campus. Um, so the, they drunk. The, the other, one is hungry and the other is drunk. Paul criticizing the people who when they're eating the Lord's Supper separately. Um, and then you have this example from the Sibylline Oracles in that where the author is um, criticizing Israel and then Israel, totally drunk, won't understand, she won't even hear, burdened with weak ears, but when the raging venom of the Most High comes upon the Hebrews, so forth. Um, so the, the flip side of this is that when you talk about something as really extreme intense and you use it a lot because it's fun to talk in really intense and extreme language, uh, you do it too much, it doesn't sound as, as intense as it used to. So for example, uh, if I say, oh, how are you today? And, and someone replies, oh, I'm feeling whelmed. Um, today we think that's sort of like, eh, eh, that's, I don't know, I'm fine. Um, versus I'm feeling overwhelmed. Whelmed used to mean what we mean by overwhelmed today, uh, but people kept using overwhelmed because they wanted to make it sound stronger, and then whelmed sort of stopped, and now we just have overwhelmed. And, and that, that happens, and that happens with the perfect. So not all perfect states necessarily are intensive um, because that intensity has been bleached in a lot of cases. Uh, high frequency verbs especially, <coughs> oida, um, is, is one, and, and that's, sort of, that's sort of the end of it. Just to summarize then, uh, I'm less interested in definitions than what the raw data says, um, and there's a clear preference for verbs with change of state, um, and something that looks like event completion, result state in, from the event structure, in, in the usage. Um, you can call it something else, you can call it uh, stative, you can call it combinative as we did in our, um, in our JETS article, you can call it imperfective if you want, 
Um, but this is what I've written, um, and I'm not going to change it. So, uh, And there's a preference for the subject to be what's referring to the state, but not always. It depends on what verbs are being used. So things to keep an eye out for. Um, and also watch out for those, those voice alternations. They'll get you. Um, that's it. Uh, this is my, my wife and I are joining Wycliffe, as we said. Uh, you can learn more about that uh, there. And my slides will be up online soon, so thanks.